What's going on, guys? It's Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring, and we're going to be going through my highest yield internal medicine questions, tips, tactics, as well as some test taking strategies at the end of this video. So like the video, subscribe, please share this with your friends, trying to share the knowledge and let's get into it. If you want to stay connected, I'm most active on Twitter. It's action underscore AP. All right. So this section, the medicine section is 50 to 60% of your step two. So if you see something here, you need to remember it. It's essentially beyond high yield can show up on your actual USMLE. This stuff is just floridly all over NBME practice exams. So make sure you know this stuff. Number one, if you see a regular wide complex tachycardia plus hypotension, that's unstable VTAC. You want to immediately synchronize cardio vert these patients. And so if you see a blood pressure of, let's say, 90 systolic with a regular wide complex tachycardia, that should be a trigger answer for you. Synchronized cardiovert for unstable VTAC. So here's a super important note here. If you see pulseless VTAC or VFib, those are the two instances that you want to defibrillate. So my mnemonic here is you defib, VFib, as well as pulseless VTAC. So note the difference here. If it's hypotensive VTAC, then you do synchronized cardioversion. If it's pulseless VTAC, then you want to defib them just like you would with VFib. All right, so ACLS is beyond high yield. If you need to review what I just said, pause the video, rewind, and go back through this again because you have to know those two or three facts. All right, here's what VTAC will look like on your EKG. So you see that it is wide complex. You look at the QRS, it's wide. You can see that it's regular, so it's not VFib because VFib would be all over the place. It wouldn't be regular and uniform like this, okay? Another ACLS high yield is pulseless electrical activity or asystole. So I remember the mnemonic PEA, you push epi always, all right? And so if epi doesn't work, you go back to chest compressions and you can give amiodarone as the next approach of action, but you do not shock PEA. I want to reiterate. For your USMLE in real life, you do not shock PEA, all right? So amiodarone is kind of your backup medication if PEA push epi always fails. And you can also give amiodarone for stable VT, just as a high yield to know. And then last thing that I want to mention here about ACLS type information is if you see somebody with atrial fibrillation for over 48 hours, the NBME loves testing this fact. What's your next course of action? We want to get a TEE, a transesophageal echocardiogram, because they may have formed atrial clot. So when there's AFib, the heart is contracting desynchronously. The atria are firing here, and they're causing there to be turbulence with the blood. And this results with there not being uniform pathway of blood through the heart, and you can actually form clot in the left atrial appendage, which is a step one high yield. And then that clot can then let's say you either cardiovert this patient or you uh, giving them a rhythm control medication, you can actually shoot that clot up to the brain, cause a stroke, out to their limbs, cause acute limb ischemia, to their bowel, causing acute mesenteric ischemia. So that's why you want to make sure that they don't have a clot there so you know if you need to anticoagulate them before you cardiovert them. So just a quick recap because I want to make sure everybody's got this. Unstable VTAC, synchronized cardiovert. Pulseless VTAC, you defibrillate. VFib equals DFib. Next is PEA, push epi always. And then lastly, if they have AFib for over 48 hours, you want to get some kind of an echo to see if they have atrial clot that is formed. The best type of echo is going to be a TEE if the patient will tolerate the anesthesia to get a TEE because you can get the best look at the heart with that. If they just show on the test, the answer TTE, transthoracic echocardiogram. If there's no other form of echo, that answer could be correct as well. All right, number two, if you see anemia plus a new S3 heart sound, I want you thinking high output heart failure. This is super high yield because a lot of schools don't actually teach high output heart failure in much depth, but it does show up on the NVMEs. And so if you see this, don't be fooled by answer choices such as a left ventricular diastolic or systolic dysfunction, because that's not the issue. The issue is that it's a high output heart failure. And I've seen that tested on the NVMEs. That's why I put this in asterisks here. And as you'll see going through this guide, as well as my other guides, if something is diagnostic, it's going to be an orange highlight. If something is a treatment, it's going to be in yellow. And if something is high yield, it's going to be either bolded or red or something that I share with you guys audibly throughout this lecture recording. All right. So if you see S3 plus clues of anemia, 
like a hemoglobin of 4 to 10 usually on the NBME. They could have a hematocrit of, let's say, 12 to 30. They might have dark tarry stool, dark tarry stools. Then I want you thinking high output heart failure, super high yield. And so the pathogenesis, just so you can remember this, this is more for step one, but I like to actually have a way to remember this stuff is if there's low hemoglobin, there's low oxygen, there's low oxygen, and you have to increase your cardiac output to maintain the oxygen delivery to your tissues. So that's how you get high output heart failure. So here's some other causes of high output heart failure besides the anemia. Number one is an AV fistula. And so I see this a lot with patients because I do arteriovenous fistula creation as a vascular surgery resident. And so our dialysis patients will oftentimes have heart failure. And so it's not always because of coronary artery disease or an MI that they have the heart failure. It can actually be from their arteriovenous fistula creating a circuit with increased preload back to the heart. And the heart actually has to go through a high output phase before it eventually fails. And it's something to look out for on their echoes. Next is thyrotoxicosis. All the catecholamine release, as you can imagine, can cause the heart to work extra hard. So high output heart failure. Paget's disease of the bone. This one is straight out of pathoma, if you guys remember this from step one. So what happens is you have all these arteriovenous fistulas created through the bone that's thickened with Paget's disease. And it can actually cause essentially an AV fistula within the bone, for lack of a better way of explaining it. And so that shortcuts the blood and shoots the preload back to the heart. So think about a fistula as essentially, instead of the blood going all the way down, let's say your leg, a fistula will shortcut it and bring it back to the heart. So that's why your preload is increased even more. And then lastly here is beriberi disease. You need to remember wet beriberi is associated with high out heart failure as well. All right, number three, patient comes in with IV drug use. They could say IV heroin or they have track marks on their arm and a new systolic murmur plus new neck pain. What do you think? Well, I want you to think of infective endocarditis causing discitis osteomyelitis. This is something I've seen tested on the NBMEs before, and it's due to the hematogenous seeding of staph or pseudomonas to the cervical spine. So if you just see IV drugs plus a new systolic murmur, I want you thinking infective endocarditis. But if you see another symptom such as neck pain or low back pain, I want you thinking that it could possibly be hematogenous seeding of the disc in your cervical spine or your lumbar spine, et cetera. So the two most common bugs is going to be staph or pseudomonas. And the treatment for infective endocarditis is antibiotics for at least four to six weeks, such as vancomycin to cover the staph. But if the patient has a prosthetic valve, you want to add in rifampin and gentamicin, that's testable. And then if they're an IV drug user, you want to add cefepime or piperacillin tazobactam. So you want to cover pseudomonas if they're an IV drug user. Super, super important. So standard course is vancomycin. They have prosthetic, you add rifampin and gentamicin. And if they have IV drug use in their history, you add cefepime. So this patient with this clinical scenario here, IV drugs would get vancomycin plus cefepime or piperacillin and tazobactam to make sure they cover staph and pseudomonas. All right, number four here. I'm gonna go through kind of like my own chest pain or acute coronary syndrome algorithm. This works for me. This has gotten me questions on NBME or USMLEs. So take this with you. Hopefully a few points will stick with you and get you a point here or there. So number one, you're never wrong to give aspirin or oxygen in these circumstances. And so next thing that I would do is get an EKG and a troponin. And so the reason why you want to get an EKG before you necessarily just give nitroglycerin is because if the patient's having a right-sided MI, you're going to drop their preload and they're going to get really hypotensive. And so nitroglycerin, if you remember, is a venous capacitance increaser. It basically dilates your veins and that's going to drop your preload because you're not shooting that blood back to your heart. And so on your EKG, you'll see a 2, 3, an AVF ST elevation with a right-sided MI. So that's when you'd want to hold nitroglycerin. Otherwise, you can go ahead and give it. If the likelihood of having an MI based upon the EKG is high, then you want to send the patient to the cath lab. They can either get PCI, they can get lysis, they can get a stent, depending on what's going on. That's going to be beyond the scope of your step two, but you want to send them to the cath lab. If there's an intermediate chance of an MI, then you want to give the patient a stress test. If they can exercise, do an exercise stress test. If they cannot exercise, let's say they have lower extremity peripheral artery disease, they can't even walk five feet. Maybe they need a regadenosine or other pharmacologic stress test. 
So let's go through a practice question for this. Patient with a four-month history of shortness of breath that resolves with rest and an EKG with stable left bundle branch block and no ST changes, what do you do? You want to get an exercise stress test because this patient may have stable angina. So don't get fooled by the symptom of shortness of breath. The key here is that the shortness of breath resolves with rest. And I've seen that as a confounder for stable angina because stable angina is not always going to classically be just like substernal crushing elephant on your chest type pain because I've seen this in prior NVME questions where they only give you the shortness of breath plus a history of a stable left bundle branch block and no ST changes. And so the trick that students miss is if it's stable angina, you don't necessarily need to get a troponin before you continue working them up. You can go straight to the exercise stress test and do that at an outpatient basis. And so let's say if you saw a new left bundle branch block, what should you do? Well, in that case, you'd want to get the troponin and you want to work them up for a myocardial infarction. But this patient here, the key is that it said it was a stable left bundle branch block. So you're not concerned for an MI in this instance because the pain resolves with rest. There's no new EKG changes. So you want to do the exercise stress test next. So keep in mind, if there's a new left bundle branch block, then you want to get the troponin and then trigger the algorithm for chest pain. So send them to the cath lab if they need to be, et cetera. So those are some easy ways that you can get tripped up on these chest pain or acute coronary syndrome questions. All right, next let's talk about polycythemia vera. So some symptoms that I like you to know for your boards is number one, erythromalalgia. So this is pain and red-blue discoloration in your digits usually. And that's due to micro clots, basically clogging up those tiny little capillary beds that causes painful digits. Number two is pruritus after showers. And that's thought, thought to be due to cytokine release from all of the proliferation of your cell lineages with polycythemia vera. And then also you're going to see splenomegaly. So to diagnose polycythemia vera, you need to know these numbers. A hemoglobin over 16 with a low EPO and generally a low MCV. You confirm your diagnosis of polycythemia vera with a bone marrow biopsy. So read your question carefully. If it says, what would be your next step? The next step would be to get a CBC so you can look at the hemoglobin. But if they said what would confirm the diagnosis of this suspected polycythemia vera, you would say bone marrow biopsy. So this is purely test taking at this point. Whether or not you read the last line of the question correctly is going to direct you towards your answer choice for the question. The treatment for polycythemia vera is going to be phlebotomy. So literally taking blood out plus aspirin. And they have a super high risk for clots, just like we talked about with the erythromalalgia causing clots in your fingers. So you want to put the patient on aspirin. Every single patient with polycythemia should have aspirin unless there's a strict contraindication, such as a head bleed, for example. All right, test taking tip. If you see a patient with a DVT or an arterial thrombosis on your exam, you're almost never going to be wrong to start IV heparin unless there's a clear contraindication like a head bleed. So anytime you see DVT or arterial thrombosis and it says, what's the next best step for this patient with acute limb ischemia or acute mesenteric ischemia, or a DVT, IV heparin, that's your answer. Number six, normal pressure hydrocephalus. The mnemonic here is wet, wild, and wobbly. So wet being incontinence, wild being dementia, and wobbly being magnetic ataxia. And so their feet are like magnetized to the ground, it looks like. And so they're shuffling. It's hard for them to lift their feet one at a time. And so you can rule out Parkinson's because they don't have a resting tremor. And you can rule out vascular dementia because they don't have any imaging findings on their head CT or MRI that shows ischemia, and they will not have an extensive coronary artery disease or peripheral artery disease history. So if a patient's had like four MIs, they have peripheral artery disease requiring lower extremity bypasses, they've had a cabbage, you're probably going to be leaning towards something like vascular dementia. But if the patient has wet, wild, and wobbly, I want you looking for normal pressure hydrocephalus, NPH. And so how to diagnose is you get an MRI going to show dilated ventricles as you see down below. You absolutely need to be able to recognize this image for your USMLE. And next, definitive diagnosis, you can do a lumbar puncture. Okay, and so it's normal pressure hydrocephalus. So you can assume that the pressure on the lumbar puncture is going to be relatively normal. And the treatment here is going to be a ventricular shunt. And so that's basically neurosurgery will route the from the ventricular space up in your brain down to, let's say, your peritoneum, so a VP shunt. And it can reroute that CSF fluid down to elsewhere in your body so it can just drain out and it will not be causing these dilated ventricles.
that's generally a two-part surgery with a neurosurgeon and a general surgeon causing a VP shunt because the general surgeon will help with the intra-abdominal access. Just a fun fact. All right, number seven, gout and pseudogout. The diagnosis is going to be arthrocentesis. Oftentimes, they will put that on the NBMEs rather than saying fluid aspiration. So this is really just you knowing your terminology. So arthrocentesis is what the NBME likes to go for. You world oftentimes will say fluid aspiration of the joint space with negative birefringent needles or rhomboid shaped needles, those types of things. But on the NBME, they generally go with arthrocentesis. The treatment for gout and pseudogout is going to be an NSAID, colchicine, or steroids. So you always start least invasive to most invasive. Generally for acute attacks of gout, you're going to say NSAID or colchicine, and you can add on steroids if you need to, if those fail. But then when it gets to be chronic, you're looking at allopurinol or febuxostat. You guys may remember from first aid and as well as step one that probetacid was another treatment for chronic gout. That's second line now. The safety profile is not quite as good as allopurinol or febuxostat, which are both considered first line treatments. Allopurinol is used more often in my experience, but both are fair game with their answer choices. All right, a high yield association you absolutely need to know. Pseudogout is associated with hemochromatosis. That is testable. I've seen that tested myself. And you also need to be able to diagnose this x-ray right here of the knee. So this is chondrocalcinosis. You can see right here in the joint space. And that is associated with pseudogout until proven otherwise on your exam. So make sure that you know this. You have to be able to recognize this chondrocalcinosis with pseudogout. Next, let's talk about stuff for the thyroid. This is one of the hottest topics on your USMLE as well as your internal medicine shelf exam. Really difficult, so bear with me. So let's say a clinical scenario here, somebody with low TSH, but high T4 and a hot nodule. So I like to kind of almost work backwards in this instance. I think about, okay, there's a nodule. What are the things it could be? And I say, okay, there's high T4. What are the things it could be? And then, okay, there's low TSH. So that means that it's probably coming from that hot nodule, suppressing the TSH. So this is a toxic adenoma. So let's go through the algorithm. You need to know this. This will show up and save your life a dozen times on test day if you know this. So first off, anybody with hyperthyroidism, you want to measure TSH as well as their T3 and T4. If their TSH is high, then this basically tells you it's secondary hyperthyroidism, generally from some kind of a tumor in the pituitary gland, and that's going to be causing the hyperthyroidism. You can have even TRH release causing TSH release, causing T3 and T4 release with a hypothalamic tumor, but that's a lot more lower yield. Next is primary hyperthyroidism. So generally, this is if you see high T3 or T4 and a low TSH. And so first you see, do they have signs of Graves' disease? Do they have goiter? Do they have ophthalmopathy? Meaning they have the exophthalmos or the proptosis from the glycosaminoglycan deposition behind their eye? Well, if yes, then obviously Graves' disease. Easy enough. If they don't have that, then you can do a RIU scan, which is radioactive iodine uptake. And so if the Ryu scan is high uptake, then you know that it's going to be something like, depending if it's diffuse or nodular, if it's diffuse, it's Graves, and it's probably early enough that they haven't developed the symptoms yet. But if it's nodular, what things have nodules? Well, toxic adenoma or multinodular goiter. So the right-hand side of this chart is the trickier part. So let's go through this a little bit slower. So starting from the top, we have TSH, free T3, and T4 all measured. Let's say the TSH is low and then the free T3 and T4 is high. Okay, so thinking it's something to do with your thyroid, you check them for Graves' disease. They don't have that the symptomology. You do a Ryu scan. What if the Ryu scan does not uptake? Well, why would you have high free T3 and T4 then? Well, it can either be thyroiditis, iodine exposure, or exogenous hormone intaking. And so you want to measure patient's serum thyroglobulin. If it's low, that means it's being suppressed from them taking a ton of exogenous hormones. If their serum thyroglobulin is high, then it's thyroiditis or iodine exposure. So you have to know this. So let's go through this again. You do your Ryu. If it's high, you see if it's high in one spot or high all over. If it's high all over, it's Graves. If it's high in one spot or a couple spots, making toxic adenoma or multinodular goiter. The Ryu scan does not uptake the iodine. You want to then measure the thyroglobulin. So this is how they could ask you what's the next best step. So after Ryu, if the Ryu is low, you get thyroglobulin. If the thyroglobulin is low, 
then you know that it's exogenous hormone uptake from them basically injecting thyroid hormone and they have just suppressed their body's own thyroglobulin production. If the thyroglobulin is high, then it's thyroiditis or iodine exposure. And so you could have thyroiditis with something like subacute dequere veins thyroiditis. So make sure you know that as well. All right. So let's go through a scenario again. We got to hammer this in because it is so testable. You find a thyroid nodule, then what? Well, you're going to get a TSH and an ultrasound of the thyroid. Let's say the TSH is low, then you do a RIU. If the TSH is normal or high, then you can get a fine needle aspiration. So let's go up to this chart here. So thyroid nodule, TSH is low. What do you do? Okay, well, you can do a RIU scan. Let's say that the TSH is normal or high. Well, this is not part of the algorithm here, but what you can do next is to get a fine needle aspiration of your thyroid. And so I want you guys to be careful here because this algorithm is slightly different than what Pathoma says back in the day when you guys were studying for step one. So this is why students are always confused by this. So last time I'm going to go over this. Find a nodule, you get TSH and ultrasound of the thyroid. TSH is low, then you're going to do a RIU scan. This is the algorithm right here. If the TSH is normal or high, your next step is going to be a fine needle aspiration. And so this is really important. Make sure you guys drill it into your head. I hope this is helpful. Next, let's go through this little algorithm here. That's basically what I just said. So get a TSH level and thyroid ultrasound. So TSH is low. You do Ryu. The Ryu is going to tell you if it's hot or cold, essentially. So they could have diffuse uptake. They could have low uptake, etc. But if the TSH is normal or elevated, remember your next step is a fine needle aspiration, not a Ryu. So I hope you guys have got this. That's the last time I'm going to say all that stuff. Number 10. Don't get thrown off by an answer choice in these thyroid questions saying chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. This is literally just another name for, for Hashimoto's that you remember from step one. And so Hashimoto's will present most commonly on the boards as hypothyroidism. But I want you to know, because I saw one question once where it presented with hyperthyroidism in the acute phase, but it would have diffusely decreased uptake on the Ryu scan. So that's the key, is if you see the hyperthyroidism from the acute phase of Hashimoto's, but it's diffusely decreased uptake, then you know that it is Hashimoto's acute phase. Number 11, 70 year old comes in with fever, a white blood cell count of 80,000, that's over 80% lymphocytes. What's your diagnosis? It's gonna be CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Remember this can aggressively transform with a Richter transformation, but if you think it's CLL, what's your next step in diagnosis? Well, you're gonna do a quantitative immunoglobulin assay, also known as flow cytometry. So generally, UWorld will test you on flow cytometry, but the NBME on your actual test is going to put quantitative immunoglobulin assay. I've seen them test it that way multiple times. And for the treatment for CLL is fludarabine. The definitive treatment is going to, of course, be a stem cell transplant, but you can start them on fludarabine in the meantime. So a high yield association that I've seen tested is CLL is associated with warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So let's talk about the treatment algorithm for warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. First off is steroids. If steroids fail, you do IVIG. If IVIG fails, you go to splenectomy. So that's your treatment algorithm. Steroids, IVIG, splenectomy. All right. Next, if you find an alcoholic that's found down by the road, he has a creatinine over two and red-brown urine, you're thinking acute tubular necrosis. So on your diagnosis, you're going to get a UA. You're going to see muddy brown casts. That is basically pathognomonic for ATN. The FENA is going to be over 2%. You have to memorize that cutoff for intrinsic renal disease. And your BUN to creatinine ratio is going to be less than 15 in most circumstances. I personally go by the muddy brown cast and the FENA more as it's more reliable than the BUN to creatinine ratio. And so the treatment is going to be hydration and replace the potassium if they're in the polyuric phase. Because remember, ATN has an oliguric and a polyuric phase. If they're in the polyuric phase, they're peeing out a ton of fluids and they can actually get hypokalemic. And so they lose all their electrolytes. So you want to be on top of replacing it very aggressively. If your hydration does not help the ATN, then these patients may need dialysis. And so in this clinical scenario with an alcoholic found down by the road, you want to watch for rhabdomyolysis. If the patient has high CK, especially, and then also if they have hypocalcemia, because with rhabdo, your cells burst. 
And remember, ATP is within cells. The P stands for phosphate. And so the phosphate from inside the cell leaks out. And it's going to bind to the calcium. It's going to cause hypocalcemia. And so you'll see high CK with hypocalcemia with rhabdo. All right, next. If somebody is on heparin and their platelets drop on day five, or sorry, the platelets on day five are 350,000. And by day seven, they drop to 50,000. This is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And so this usually occurs between days five through 10. And this is type two hit. There is a type one hit, but it's generally asymptomatic and nothing that you need to worry about. And that occurs in the first one to three days, usually, of being on heparin. That is going to be asymptomatic, self-resolving, can stop the heparin if their platelets drop too low. Otherwise, you can keep the patient on the treatment course. Generally, these patients with HIT, you only need a 30% drop in platelets to actually diagnose HIT. All right, and so with HIT, you want to watch out for skin necrosis, especially HIT type 2 that we're talking about in this scenario. And so here's a picture down below of what the skin necrosis will look like. Warfarin can also get this if you're a member. So if you get warfarin-induced skin necrosis, what would you do? Well, you give vitamin K and IV heparin. What about if you have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia causing skin necrosis? Well, you're going to use a direct thrombin inhibitor like Argatraban or Bivalirudin. And it's important to know that Argatraban can be used if they have end-stage renal disease because it's metabolized by your liver. So Argatraban if end-stage renal, Bivalirudin if end-stage liver disease. And so most of my patients are either patients with peripheral vascular disease that have nephropathy or they have end-stage renal disease and they're on dialysis, these patients are going to be on our gatribian. This is what I use almost universally in the hospital. I almost never use bivalirudin because I don't really work with patients that have liver disease oftentimes. So hopefully that little anecdotal reminder will help. So a reminder for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Do not give platelets. Even if the platelets are super low in the question stem, this will cause more consumption of the platelets by the PF4 factor complexes getting attaching to the platelets and destroying them. And this can worsen the thrombosis. So here's another high yield association with HIT. What about if they have HIT and the patient now has leg swelling? Well, you want to get a venous duplex of their leg to check for DVT because with the platelet consumption and HIT, they're also at high risk of clots elsewhere. All right. Number 14, patient has pain with moving their ear. What's your diagnosis? Generally, it's going to be otitis externa. And so the treatment for that is fluoroquinolone and hydrocortisone eardrops. But what if the patient has a history of diabetes or they're immunocompromised? They might have HIV, they might have cancer, and you see granulation tissue in the ear canal. That's kind of a buzz phrase to look out for in the NVME. Well, you want to give the patient IV antibiotics to cover pseudomonas, watching for necrotizing otitis externa. And the key here is if it's just regular old otitis externa, like you would see at like a family practice clinic, this patient would get fluoroquinolone and hydrocortisone eardrops. The difference is, is if they have the granulation tissue or they're severely immunocompromised or diabetic, then they get IV antibiotics to cover for the pseudomonas. So the mechanism of action actually does matter in this for your USMLE. So something that's high yield for your family medicine and peace shelf is that if you have a child with frequent ear infections, they have a very high risk for developmental delay and especially language delays. Number 15, this one's crazy high yield. So tune in. If there's new urinary frequency or thirst plus hypercalcemia plus a family history of men's syndrome, what's your diagnosis? Well, this is going to be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And you might be like, how the heck is that related? So check this out. It's due to the hyperparathyroidism that you get with men's syndrome. Let's say it's men one syndrome. That hyperparathyroidism is going to cause high calcium. The high calcium basically makes the kidneys resistant to antidiuretic hormone, ADH. And so what happens is you get an induced nephrogenic DI. And so your best treatment for nephrogenic DI is, a, is hydrochlorothiazide, and you diagnose it with a 24-hour urine study that will show you low osmolality as well as generally a normal to low sodium level. And it's because you're basically peeing out all of your electrolytes, but it's so much that it's going to be diluted, okay? So you have low osmolality in the 24-hour urine study. The trick here is that if hydrochlorothiazide fails for nephrogenic DI, then you try endomethacin. Endomethacin is an NSAID that's going to decrease renal blood flow and it's going to decrease the urine output. But what about if it's lithium-induced DI? The treatment here is going to be amiloride, and this is loved by the NBME. 
And it's because amylaride is going to block the cation lithium uptake in your renal tubule. And so essentially, you're not going to absorb that lithium anymore. It's not going to cause any more nephrogenic DI. Number 16, a chest x-ray below with a CD4 count of less than 200. What's your diagnosis? You're going for pneumocystis. And so sometimes they'll put it as pneumocystis gerbecii. Other resources will say it's pneumocystis carani. Just look for the word pneumocystis. And so the thing that med students generally forget is they see this chest x-ray, they think it's a home run. They're like, oh, perfect, it's pneumocystis. But then the question says, well, what's your treatment protocol? And so the treatment is going to be at least three weeks of Bactrim, which is SMXTMP, or pentamidine, or primaquin plus clinda. And if the patient has decreasing partial pressure of oxygen less than 70, or an AA gradient over 35, you add steroids. So almost nobody remembers those cutoffs. So basically, if they have poor oxygenation, you want to add steroids. And so this chest x-ray is pathognomonic for pneumocystis in a patient that's immunocompromised with a low CD4 count less than 200 for pneumocystis. All right. Now we're going to go over a couple test-taking tips for the USMLE. So number one is I want you to rule out the other answers if you can't rule your answer completely in. So first thing you should be doing is process of elimination. You can't rule yours in definitively, rule others out. And sometimes there might be one sentence in the question stem that disproves a whole answer. So use that to cross it out. Number two, if you know one of the facts in the question stem supports your answer choice to be true and the other aspects of the question stem you're not sure about, pick the choice that you are at least partially sure about. So don't just pick the zebra because you don't know if it's true or false about it. I mean, you could pick a zebra that's completely unrelated in that regard. And then number three, if you're down between two answer choices and you still don't know, pick the more common answer choice. And it's because if you're playing odds, the most common cause is going to be tested more commonly than something that's a complete zebra, right? So why not take your bets and put it on something that you know is tested more? And that's going to give you a better shot than just picking an answer that you've never heard of, which you will go to your USMLE. And many students will see answer choices that they don't even know what the diagnosis is or they've never heard of the diagnosis. And that's fine. Don't just trigger select that answer choice unless you have methodically ruled out every single other A through D answer choice and you're left with E, which is something you don't know. That is the only time you pick a zebra is if you have ruled out everything else. And then tip number five, like this video, subscribe and share it with your classmates. Spread the knowledge. Hopefully this helps save you if you're studying for your internal medicine shelf or for your USMLE step two. All right, guys, Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring and take it easy. Thank you for listening.